Good afternoon. And a very special good afternoon to the graduating economists of 2016. My name is Jim Adams. I chair the Department of Economics, and I'm delighted to welcome you to these commencement festivities. You don't have to walk very far around campus today to realize that commencement is a moment of myriad ceremonies. Departments have their ceremonies. Schools and colleges have their ceremonies. The university has a ceremony. Even within our department, this is just one of several formal celebrations. So why do we have so many different ceremonies inside the department? Is there anything more to it than just the nominal difference between undergraduate and graduate degrees? Anything more than a predilection for or against the appearance of beach balls at the ceremony? I personally think there is a difference, and let me try to explain why. For most undergraduates, commencement marks the beginning of separation from the university. True, many undergraduates will continue to watch Michigan football and basketball on television, but they will no longer feel closely connected to the academic enterprise of the university. They will focus less on the meaning of opportunity cost than on the opportunity cost of seeking life's meaning. For those of who major in economics, commencement really entails the estrangement from the identity of being an economist. In contrast, for most of you, commencement will mark a reinforcement of your ties to the economics profession. Commencement should say to you, congratulations, you've arrived. You are no longer studying to be an economist. You are an economist, a Michigan economist, a member of a community with a rich history and a distinctive identity within the economics profession. So it's important to discover and embrace that rich history and that distinctive identity. It's important to understand that Michigan economics is much more than the faculty and staff and students who currently inhabit Lorch Hall. So I urge you in the years to come to do three things. First, learn more about the undergraduates who studied economics here. The kind of people you taught if you were a GSI, or perhaps mentored if you were a GSRA. You may know some of the current crop, but what about those who have come before? Michigan undergraduates in economics have gone on to get PhDs in economics and to become professors at places like Harvard, Stanford, Yale, Amherst, and Williams, and yes, the University of Michigan. I'm thinking specifically of my current co colleague, Dominic Bartelme. Second, learn more about economists who once taught here. In addition to the work of your own teachers, who, for example, are recent players at the Council of Economic Advisors, discover the work of Warren Smith and Gardner Ackley, both of whom were members of the Council of Economic Advisors, at a pivotal moment of economic policy making in the 1960s. In addition to the work of your own teacher who has been tapped by President Obama for the governorship of the Federal Reserve System, discover the work of Ned Gramlich, a governor just before the recent financial crisis. And in addition to the work of your own teachers who edit major journals and occupy important positions of responsibility in the American Economic Association, discover the work of Henry Carter Adams, no relation, Fred Taylor, I. Leo Scharfman, and Gardner Ackley again. All four were members of our faculty when they were elected as presidents of the American Economic Association. <laughs> Finally, learn more about your predecessors in the master's and PhD programs. The multitude of individuals who have studied learned and blossomed here in Ann Arbor. Our graduate alumni have taken major academic positions in research universities and in liberal arts colleges, uh, in major non-academic positions in government and in the private sector, in this country and abroad. 
We'll hear more about the successes of this year's students in the PhD program and this year's students in the MAE program from professors Tisar and Leitner in a very few minutes. In short, I want to suggest to you that Michigan economics has a history, and that history has created a rather distinctive identity. Michigan e economics is known for uh, its savvy mixture of rigor and relevance. Students learn here the power of cutting edge research tools and the importance of socially relevant research agendas. You are now part of that tradition. You now share that identity. I know this, and I know it because I have worked with four of you, primarily in the form of collaboration in undergraduate teaching. I know the talent, the dedication, and the competence that fills this room. So, welcome to the metaphysical Lorch Hall that has no walls. You are no longer studying economics at Michigan. You are now a Michigan economist. Congratulations. <laughs> it's my pleasure now uh, to introduce Professor Linda Tisar, uh, who will be conducting the next portion of uh, this ceremony. Professor Tisar has really done it all. She has been uh, a very exciting undergraduate teacher she has been a distinguished graduate teacher, the director of the graduate program. Uh, she has served at the University of Michigan as chair of the economics department. I find myself often asking what would Linda do uh, in this particular set of circumstances or another. And she has come back relatively recently from a stint at the Council of Economic Advisors. I feel very fortunate to be her colleague and to present her to you now, Linda. Thank you, Jim. Uh, well, it's a great privilege to share this happy occasion with you, uh, the graduates and your family and friends. I think uh, I'm looking at the faces in front of me. Uh, you all know how hard you worked for this. I think your family knows how hard you worked for this. Um, so let's give them a round of applause, and in particular, let's thank our families for all the support they've given. I'm really so proud of this group, and I, I look forward to hearing all, the, all of the things that their advisors uh, will be saying about their work. Um, but before I pass the uh, microphone over, I just wanted to make a couple of uh, fairly brief remarks. Um, one is, I want to note just the outstanding accomplishments of this group of graduates from the PhD program. Um, the placement of this group is incredible, and I think you'll agree with me when you hear about their work. Um, what an amazing amount of uh, new cutting-edge research uh, is being done, has been done, uh, and will continue to be done by this uh, wonderful group of scholars. Um, I also secondly want to say that I'm especially proud to see so many women receive their doctorates uh, here today. Historically, the field of economics hasn't been all that friendly, unfortunately, uh, to women. Uh, the first woman hired uh, by the Department of Economics here at Michigan was Eva Mueller. She was an expert in development economics and demography, and she received her PhD from Harvard in 1951. When she completed her degree on a day like this one, she asked the chairman of the department for help in finding a job. She recalled, he said he couldn't help me since economics wasn't a woman's field. Further, he remarked that if he had thought that she actually wanted to work as an economist, uh, he wouldn't have let her begin her degree in the first place. Some 40 years later, I completed my PhD uh, and during one of my job interviews at a major, inter uh, major university, I was told that it was impossible to have a career as an economist and raise a family. I have three wonderful boys, so I think we can dispel with that piece of advice as well. So why am I telling you this? Well, first I want to say that I believe the world of economics is now a friendlier place for women. At least I hope this group has found it so. Uh, in recent years, between a quarter and a third of our PhD graduates are women, so I think there's real progress, uh, though we can and we should do better. 
And I hope that while you've been a student here, you've been able to move through the university relatively free from prejudices and attitudes that might have limited your progress. But I also want to say, and this is my second uh, point in raising this particular issue, is that even though I think Eva and maybe me and Catherine and others of our colleagues and Martha uh, have knocked a few cracks uh, in that glass ceiling, uh, maybe we've even opened a few windows for you to crawl through, you'll likely at some point in your career face some discrimination. And these barriers won't just face women, so this just isn't about talking to the women graduates. It might be an attitude about gender, about race, about your religious preferences, about what kind of family you want to have, or when you want to have it, or your sexual preference. It might masquerade as something else entirely, so you don't even know this is what's happening when it's happening. It'll be an attitude that somehow you can't succeed because of something about who you are. And when this happens, it's going to bother you. It bothered me. It may make you mad, maybe not right away, but later, you'll be really mad. Uh, and it may make you question your abilities. It may make you think you don't belong. But here's my advice to you. When that happens, I want you to think back to right here, right now. What you did to get here. You've undertaken an extremely difficult thing, and you've done it. You've worked very, very hard to get to where you are today. So when you hit those barriers, know that you can draw on the talent, the energy, and the intelligence that you needed to get to this point, and you can persevere. So now, you're taking on a mantle as the next generation of researchers, advisors, mentors, teachers, uh, career economists. You're doing all kinds of things in this next phase of your career. So now you have the responsibility of making things better for the next generation. I'm so very proud of you, and I know you'll do that, uh, and I can't wait to hear about all of your accomplishments. So, to the graduates. And now, I guess, the uh, advisors will come up and say a word or two in turn about each one of their students. So, I understand there's a list here. So if I could invite uh, Paolo and Dean Yang up. And I'll let you, uh, as you come up, you can announce the next person coming. But if you go on too long, I'm warning you, I'm gonna grab the microphone, okay. so. <laughs> You can do a little dance one. <laughs> <laughs> Paolo Abarkar, congratulations. Paolo's uh, dissertation is on the economics of international migration and development. Paolo wrote a groundbreaking and compelling dissertation on the topic, and broadly it's about how international migration affects development in developing countries. Um, I'll say a brief word about his job market paper, which I think uh, has the potential to be very important. Paolo is very interested in what happens when international migrant workers return home to their countries. In particular, he looked at migrant workers from the Philippines, and uh, he used an ingenious strategy to figure that out. Uh, he sent out 8,000 fake resumes to employers in the Philippines, some of which, uh, on some of which, uh, it, the resume stated that the worker had international work experience somewhere overseas, and in others, uh, the workers purely had domestic experience, and Paolo looked to see whether the ones with international work experience received more callbacks from the employers. Major research undertaking, incredibly huge amounts of logistical work and, uh, and very, very careful work on research protocols to make sure this worked, and Paolo found a very important and surprising result that international uh, migrant worker resumes actually receive fewer callbacks from employers than their purely domestic worker counterparts. Very surprising result, uh, suggesting, uh, as Paolo says in, dis in his dissertation, that perhaps um, employers uh, think that international migrant workers actually lose some of their country-specific work human capital while they're overseas. Very, very important result, not incredibly um, uh, optimistic about this one particular angle of migration development, but very important for us to know uh, in the international development community. So, congratulations, Paolo. Okay. Next, we have Lindsay Baker. 
uh, our PhD graduate, who will be uh, presented by Martha Bailey. So hi, um, this is terrific. I, I'm, I think Lindsay might be one of the graduate students that I've known the longest. She's got field interests in I.O. and labor. And as her, um, her interests evolved, it was more economic history and health that really got her fascinating. Her dissertation covers a novel and completely understudied topic. Um, she works on the history of breastfeeding and the effects of policy on that. And it's also kind of striking, if you think about it, how much time women actually spend doing this and how little work by economists has actually considered this. So Lindsay not only um, documents changes in breastfeeding behavior over the majority of the 20th century, cobbling together data and making use of a lot of different data sets to describe this, but she also covers and evaluates two important policies that interact with it, both the WIC program and also, more recently, lactation support laws in the workplace. Now, I should say, it's just something else, Lindsay, I've got to put this out there. She did all of this. She wrote this fantastic dissertation while having not one, not two, but four children in our PhD program. So Lindsay, <laughs> Lindsay is an extraordinary example of what Linda was talking about, our ability to combine both family and work, and Lindsay's been a real inspiration, I think, to all of us who, who've, I've, you know, I, Lindsay started before I did having children, so she's been an inspiration to me, too. Um, so Lindsay's landed a fantastic job at Ford, and I know that they think that they've gotten a great economist, but I don't think they know the half of it. They wouldn't have had a shot at her if she hadn't have also been as committed to staying in Michigan with her family. So congratulations, Lindsay. It's been amazing. Uh, the next person is Christopher Ben. Uh, uh, yes, introduced by Chris House. <laughs> okay, I've been instructed that I have only one minute, so um, I'm going to do my best to keep it to that. Um, actually, both the next two students are my students. Chris Berm is uh, the first one who's going to be up here, and then Guadang Chen is right here, is following him up. Uh, so let me just say uh, very briefly that uh, it's been a real privilege to work uh, with Chris Berm since he started here, and also Guadeng since he started here. Um, and it's also been an extreme uh, privilege to see that all of their hard work has, uh, has uh, ultimately um, paid off. One of the really nice things about Chris's work is that so much of it is so timely and it deals so directly with current economic events. So Chris's research actually looks at how, how best the government should spend money if it wants to stimulate economic activity. And typically when economists talk about uh, fiscal stimulus like this, they're rather vague on exactly what the government should be doing with its money. It should be spending on something or other. Um, but what Chris did is he decided to, to ask whether it actually would be better for the government to buy more durable goods, like, uh, I don't know, automobiles, things that last for a long time, or whether it would be better to buy more non-durable goods, perishables and food and whatnot, stuff like that. And when he first brought this to my attention, I was sure that it was going to have to be the durable goods purchases that would be mo most effective. But surprisingly, his empirical results, uh, the data seems to show exactly the opposite, that, that buying durable goods has the least effect on economic activity. Um, this was a, a really heavy uh, empirical data undertaking, and the results are very, very compelling. Um, so I was uh, very impressed with uh, 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 the work once it was completed. So congratulations. Chris has accepted a position at the University of Texas, and I fully expect that he's going to invite his advisor <laughs> down to experience some of the barbecue in Texas as soon as he gets here. <laughs> This is, a, this is a, a long-standing tradition in Michigan. You are required to invite your advisor <laughs> wherever you go. Guadang, you're uh, next on the list. Um, so don't forget. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, 
Uh, so as promised, the next person on the list is also my student, Guareng Chen. Um, uh, just as it as did with Chris, uh, when Guadeng first started in the program, uh, he, was, he showed up in my class in Econ 607, and I knew uh, very quickly that Guadeng was going to be a very, very uh, skilled uh, and successful researcher, and he has uh, um, succeeded along, uh, along that dimension. Um, just as uh, I mentioned with Chris Berm's research, Guadeng's research is very, very timely and uh, directly connected to current economic events. Most of his research has a, a fairly strong finance component, uh, which naturally fits in very well with the recent financial crisis. His main research contribution dealt with the role of securitization in subprime borrowing. Um, and what he essentially did, he developed both, both a theoretical study and a empirical data study of securitization. And according to the theoretical study, you would expect that in, in areas where there was, where the market expected high housing price growth, you would expect that in, in those environments, that's exactly where you should see a lot of securitization, that is a lot of mortgages being sold to secondhand buyers. And you would also expect to see uh, a lot of credit extended to risky borrowers. And so he assembles a data set that is uh, that has many different regions and he looks to see whether there's evidence of this pattern in the data and he finds that indeed this is exactly what you what you see in the data in in areas where there was rapid house price acceleration it's exactly in those areas where you saw the most credit being extended to the riskiest borrowers um, and you saw the most the highest incidence of uh, originate to distribute uh, lending again very very credible very timely um, research uh, research paper. Uh, Guadeng has accepted a position at NYU Shanghai and uh, same admonition for Chris. I expect to be out there very shortly. So congratulations. Okay, the next student is Eric Chin and I think Martha is up again. So it's my pleasure to talk today about um, Eric Chin's dissertation. Um, I want to say, so Eric Chin is an economist with a voracious appetite, I'd say, for hard questions. Um, after all, not many people would take on one of, uh, I think, the interpretation of one of the most well-cited and well-known randomized controlled trials in social science and tell everyone, including some very famous economists, that they hadn't gotten the conclusion quite right. Um, so essentially, Eric's dissertation, you might have read about it in the New York Times, so I won't, I won't talk about it in great detail. But just a summary, um, essentially one of the things he shows is that when you think about who selected into this randomized control trial, that the parents in both the treatment and the control group who selected in, so before randomization, were so motivated to protect their kids from all of the bad things that happen in public housing, that even if they didn't get the treatment, the voucher to move out, those kids still did pretty well, which means that the difference between the treatment and control group and the trial are really, really small. Now, it turns out, though, that the bigger benefits of public housing, or I'd say moving out of public housing, are for the people who didn't actually get in the trial, which is one of the things that Eric shows. So, in fact, demolishing public housing units may be a much more effective way of combating the cycle of poverty than we previously understood. So, this is an extremely important dissertation, and um, we're very proud of Eric and uh, everything he's accomplished. He's on his way to UVA by a way of a postdoctoral fellowship at Brown. So congratulations, Eric. <laughs> the next person is Fan Fei, and Jim will speak. You might not know this to live in Michigan, but there was a time when the country was not covered with highways. Um, the highways had to be built, and um, there were two, it turns out there were two waves of building of highways. Um, some of the people in this room, like Joel Slemrod, are familiar, you know, remember the interstate highway building of the 1950s, I was too young. but. <laughs> 
Um, there was an earlier uh, spate of highway building that was in the 1920s that has not really been extensively studied until Fan Fei came on the scene. Uh, Fan has done some fantastic uh, data collection that involves uh, looking through musty old magazines and things like that to get information uh, from state governments and from the private sector to look at the 1920s programs of highway building in America and to analyze their consequences. And the answer is that uh, strikingly, and I would say quite convincingly in Fan's work, uh, the expansion of highways in the 1920s were responsible for the death of general stores in small towns in America. That, you know, virtually every town had general stores, but when the highways were built, they were replaced with the precursors of big box, you know, and specialty stores that you see today. Uh, Fan did that and other excellent work in his dissertation, and he's off to Northwestern College of Iowa uh, in the fall. Congratulations. Our next graduate is uh, Ibrahim Gunay, and uh, Alan Deerdorf will present. So Ibrahim came to me, well, I, I, he already had a, a fine paper that is uh, now a part of his dissertation, uh, and I thought, what more do we need? But he came to me with another idea, quite different from the other one, although both of them have dealt with international trade and, and local uh, areas within countries. He came to me with the idea uh, that the effects on localities, states within the United States uh, of changes in trade policies should depend not just on what different parts of the country produce, which had been understood well before, but also what other countries they trade with. And this becomes particularly important in the context of what you probably know about, the Trans-Pacific partnership uh, that is, has been negotiated, where the United States, if it goes through, is going to lower its tariffs uh, and reciprocally get the same from the other countries around the Pacific, all to the west of our country, uh, not to the east. And therefore, uh, it should logically make a difference uh, where you are. It should have much more impact on California and Washington and Oregon uh, than on other parts of the country. So he wanted to build a model that would explore that. and. Uh, Sounded like an interesting idea, one I hadn't thought of before. Uh, had he come to me with this uh, before he'd done it, <laughs> I think I would have said, oh, you're never going to get the data and it's way too much work. But no, he came to me after he'd done it. Uh, he had found the data, he had built the model, he had already solved the model and gotten some interesting results. Uh, so uh, that was his job market paper and it got him a job at the University of Albany, where he'll be starting in the fall. Congratulations, Ethan. Our next one uh, student is Enda Patrick Hargarden, Hargarden, and uh, <laughs> Gosh, I always thought you I always thought it was pronounced Enda Hargarden. Um, Enda uh, is has a uh, extremely interesting dissertation that looks at the consequences of the Great Crash uh, of. Uh, the, the crash of, two, oh, great crash, listen to me, uh, the crash of 2008, 2009, the consequences for the labor market in Ireland uh, by looking at the labor market before and after the crash of 08, 09. And what he finds is that there was much less tax avoidance after uh, the crash of 2008, 2009 than there was before. In the aftermath, people were pretty happy to have jobs, if you know what I mean. And, um, and there was much less of manipulating their situations than there was beforehand. Uh, easy to say, not so easy to estimate. Uh, Enda got uh, the Irish government to share all, you know, the intrusive information that Edward Snowden hadn't gotten, and he was able to analyze uh, taxpayer behavior, and it's fascinating uh, information that he has. Enda is from Ireland, I should add, and, but he is off to the University of Tennessee where they think he has a Yankee accent. <laughs> Our next graduate is Monica Hernandez, and Jeff Smith will uh, present her. <laughs> S 
Jeff Smith will present Sue Donarski, who will present <laughs> Monica Hernandez. Uh, despite appearances, I am a PhD trained economist. <laughs> In fact, I'm such a self-confident female economist, I no longer have to wear the funny stuff. Uh, so, um, uh, and this is Monica Hernandez. Uh, I have been working with Monica, I think, since she arrived uh, at Michigan. Uh, Monica cares deeply about educational outcomes. Um, of, of young people, um, um, particularly in developing countries. And her thesis, her dissertation, has explored how our society can support or hinder uh, the learning of, of children. Um, her job market paper uh, looked at the impact of violence in Colombia, uh, the, the many years long war in Colombia, on um, students' outcomes, on whether they go to school, on how much schooling they get. Um, uh, and she quantified what the cost of violence is on children's lives. Um, and that is the hallmark of, of what Monica does, is that she uh, takes what are sometimes in our social discussions kind of squishy questions and quantifies in real terms what the benefits are of programs, uh, what the costs are uh, of not improving um, children's lives. Uh, she is headed off um, to do a postdoctoral uh, fellowship in Tulane, uh, working with the city of New Orleans on improving their education system. Uh, I've been proud to work with her, and I look forward to visiting New Orleans. <laughs> and our next person, I'm not supposed to shake your hand. Uh, Chen Wee Hu and advisor is Catherine Dominguez. Okay, I am delighted uh, to present to you Chen Yu Hu. Uh, Chen Yu is a student with amazing, interesting ideas, many interesting ideas. She has a great can-do attitude and work ethic. Uh, she uh, takes criticism extremely well, and she knows when to ignore her advisor, which is incredibly <laughs> important. Um, she has done a thesis uh, looking at the home bias puzzle. And I know everyone in this room is not only holding domestic assets. So you're not part of the puzzle. If you don't know what I'm talking about, talk to your graduate, because they will tell you uh, that you need to hold a broad portfolio. But one of the puzzles that economists have long tried to understand is why so many people are overweighted in domestic assets. And what Chen Yu did is she looked to see whether or not that would still hold if we looked at the sectoral level. If we looked at particular sectors where there's high productivity, those sectors do a lot of exporting, whether or not those sectors would um, uh, also show home bias, and she finds that, in fact, the incentives work as we would expect, and there's less home bias for domestic workers who are working in areas where we have a competitive advantage. It's an incredibly important uh, dissertation. I think it's going to be published in a fantastic place. And speaking of places, Chen Yu is off to UC Santa Cruz, which is a fantastic place to live and a definitely a place where she needs to invite her advisor to come visit. <laughs> I'll take over the next person in line, finding the place on the list, is uh, Prachi. And Jeff Smith is gonna come up and present to Prachi. Uh, it is a great honor and a privilege to interact with all of the doctoral students in this program. It's one of the, one of the great joys of, of uh, being here at Michigan. It's, it's both an honor and a pleasure. And uh, I'll be up here twice, uh, but I've interacted with many of the people, and I congratulate them all. Uh, Prachi here uh, has been a lot of fun. 
uh, to interact. But we started interacting pretty early on. I think maybe in the first year even, you came up after some little spiel I gave and were asking questions and things. And uh, Prachi has, has so much uh, spirit and enthusiasm and love for economics that it just makes it a super pleasure uh, to interact with her. She, uh, she spent a couple of years in the intellectual wilderness uh, during her career here, but in the last couple of years, she found uh, a, a topic in an area that really excites her. So she's been doing uh, lab experiments, not quite labs in the field. I know there's some technical, uh, it's sort of like labs like we do here, except they're in a different place. And, and she's been studying how people behave uh, in, in risk sharing games or when they're offered the opportunity to share risk. And, and she looks and sees whether people actually take up that opportunity to share risk or not. And she's done a very nice job in her job market paper of linking up her lab experiment studies to the broader context of informal risk sharing within villages and slums in developing countries. Uh, I learned a huge amount from her dissertation. She just defended successfully yesterday. And she will be off to a postdoc at Princeton and then off to Loyola Marymount after that. So congratulations, Prachi. Next up is Brian talking about Max. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure and uh, honor to be up here to be able to tell you a little bit about uh, one of my students, Max Kaputsin. I've known Max for I guess four years now and uh, worked uh, as a research assistant for me and then as a co-author and then I uh, was given the pleasure of advising him on his dissertation. He has written uh, several essays studying the effect of various anti-poverty programs looking at areas like criminal justice, housing policy, and Medicaid um, health policy. His job market paper kind of exploits a really interesting, unique feature about the U.S. Uh, Medicaid system in which um, uh, in a change to increase uh, eligibility, the government said folks born, children born after a certain date were eligible for Medicaid, um, whereas the children born just the day before were not, no, not eligible. And he uses that discontinuity to look very long term, to look at how these different children, those who were and were not eligible, fared in their long term educational attainment and finds that there was uh, some impact in high school graduation. Um, so it's a really nice uh, look at a really important, timely issue. Um, and I think following that interest in kind of practical, um, policy oriented research, Max uh, forgo several other opportunities to take a, um, a position at a new kind of well-known research lab in the city of Chicago that is working on a variety of evaluations of social policy programs in the city. Um, I am sorry to see him go, but I'm uh, happy to see that he will only be four hours away. Um, so, uh, and I love Chicago to visit as well. So, um, congratulations. And yes, okay, so I will now uh, Gaurav Khanna, and who is, <laughs> did I, okay, good. Thanks. Thank you. I assume those cheers weren't for me. <laughs> All right, so the, uh, I'm very pleased to present Gaurav Khanna. Um, Gaurav asks a very important, widely interesting question but in a very nuanced way that yields amazing new insights in his job market paper. So I think uh, I don't need to convince anyone else in this room that uh, it is desirable to raise one's level of education uh, because it, among other things, it may improve your labor market outcomes. Um, I think that's true about everyone in this room. Um, but I think it's also interesting to uh, understand that uh, the impact of achieving more education may be different if everyone around you is also getting more education because people compete with one another in the labor market. Um, one's labor market outcomes, perhaps one's impact, impact of one getting a PhD may be very different if they were the only person in the labor market with a PhD versus if everyone and their brother had a PhD. Uh, Gaurav looks at this question in the context of a very large educational expansion in India 
and finds out that when everyone and their brother also gets higher education, one's wage returns to higher education are lower by about a third. Quite an amazing result, one of the first times this has been shown uh, convincingly in, um, in empirical work, very important contribution. Um, Gaurav, as it turns out, not only has this one uh, very exciting uh, sort of contribution in his portfolio, he also has about uh, 267 other papers <laughs> on his website. Uh, more papers than sort of most assistant professors have when they come up uh, for, uh, for tenure review. Uh, he, has, he, has, he works on topics like terrorism, uh, infrastructure, uh, affirmative action. Uh, so uh, keep a lookout for Gaurav Khanna uh, down the line. Gaurav is leaving us to go to DC for a postdoc at the Center for Global Development, after which he'll be an assistant professor at UC San Diego. Um, you don't need to invite me, I've been there many times. So, <laughs> congratulations, Gaurav. <laughs> Next up, we have Gretchen Lay, and Jim Adams will present her. I don't think so. Sorry, Jim Hines. Jim, would you like to say a few words? <laughs> uh, Gretchen Lay did a fantastically interesting and complicated dissertation. I'm, my task is to summarize it in 30 seconds, and I only get 30 seconds because Chris Howes over there is timing all of the <laughs> remarks. And, um, uh, and the thing is, it's uh, so, it, the ca calculations here were so intense that I'm not sure I uh, know all of them. In any case, uh, what she was looking at is defined benefit pensions. It's never too early to start thinking about your retirement. And uh, there's an older system of providing pensions for workers that firms do, uh, where they provide defined benefit pensions. There's a formula based on how many years you worked and what your salary was and that sort of thing, and then they calculate your pension on that basis. It doesn't really, uh, new companies don't really use that these days, but there are enough companies out there and enough workers out there that we're talking trillions of dollars of uh, defined benefit pensions out there. Uh, what effect does all of this have on corporate finance and the macro economy? Only Gretchen Lay knows. Uh, that was her dissertation. It's really interesting and I recommend it to you. She is off to Mount Holyoke College in the fall. Our next graduate is Minjun Lee, and now I'm reluctant to say who, ah, Matthew, yes. Uh, Matthew Shapiro will uh, present Minjun Lee. Uh, one of the themes of the remarks tonight, uh, today has been what a great pleasure it is for the faculty to work with graduate students, and that's really uniform across these collaborations. But for me, Min Jun is just the model of why it's so great to have our job and to, co to collaborate. Uh, he's been a full uh, partner in uh, what Charlie originally named the Minivan Michigan NYU Vanguard Project, which is now the, uh, more prosaically, the VRI. It's been a soup to nuts uh, project where Min Jun's been involved in sample design, uh, survey instruments, drawing the sample, running the survey, doing the analysis, doing heavy duty econometric modeling and uh, estimation uh, in order to figure out uh, why individuals uh, save the way they do, how they are prepared for retirement, uh, how they allocate their portfolios against different risks. This is going to be, I think, highly impactful research, and I've been delighted to uh, be, be involved with it alongside him. Uh, he will be going off to Carleton University in Canada, where I understand you can ice skate to work in the winter. I, <laughs> coming from Minneapolis, I would like to do that with you. <laughs> Catherine Lim will be introduced by uh, Jeff Smith. Uh, Katie is, is, 
is perhaps the most organized doctoral student I've ever uh, interacted with. Uh, I would get uh, typed in LaTeX uh, meeting notes prior to each of our meetings that, that uh, listed all our discussion items. And this is actually fantastically valuable. Uh, I, I have toyed with the idea of making all students I meet would do this. It's, it's, uh, it's really useful. And who knows how many things, when she typed them out, she realized she already knew the answer, and then they didn't have to make it onto the agenda. And so time was saved. Uh, Katie wrote a really neat uh, job market paper about the choice, uh, women's choice of sector around the time that they have children and whether they might perhaps go into self-employment as a way of obtaining additional flexibility in employment that would be particularly valuable at the time that they have a young child. And the methodology here was a sort of dynamic discrete choice uh, middle brow structural model, uh, which was really fun for me because some of my earlier work was on that class of models and so I got to feel nostalgic and also catch up a bit on what had happened on the literature in terms of computation and so on. But it was also exactly the right tool to use for this purpose. And doing that kind of paper is a tremendous amount of work. And while the labor theory of value, as my advisor often liked to point out, had been discarded a long time ago, and for good reason, uh, the re end result was a really nice paper. Uh, just, just a top-notch paper. I think we will do very well at the journals. And it was a great pleasure to advise Katie. She is off to uh, the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve Bank. So congratulations. Sure. U.S. Treasury? <laughs> <laughs> Oops, no, that's, that's fine too. No, that's, uh, that's, that's run by Michigan. That's, uh, Next up is Johannes, and David Lamb is going to speak about him. Congratulations. Well, it's a pleasure to talk about uh, Johannes Norling. Johannes has been a real uh, pleasure to work with, uh, doing a mix of economic history, economic development, economic demography, uh, very nicely tied together. Uh, Johannes was in the Peace Corps in Ghana before he uh, began his PhD, and he continued to have an interest in uh, Africa. He traveled with me to, to Ghana to teach a, a two-week state, of course, and was a, gr a great help and showed me around Ghana, including uh, impressive negotiating skills, buying a six-foot-long pounding stick to grind uh, cassava in the, in the market, uh, something that most foreigners don't buy in the market in, uh, in Ghana. Uh, Johannes, uh, continuing on the Africa theme, when, was the first uh, ever winner of the Lester P. Motz Award for Outstanding Graduate Student Research in Africa from our African Studies Center, and uh, I was very proud that the first winner of that was actually an economist, which is not, not what most people would have predicted. That was a great accomplishment. He also won many awards in the, uh, in the Population Studies Center and uh, uh, all around campus. Um, Johannes spent time doing dissertation research uh, in South Africa and tracked down some amazing uh, historical data sets about family planning programs in uh, South Africa. There were data sets that, that uh, he literally found in warehouses and things that nobody knew existed on, on old nine-track tapes. Uh, used them very effectively to look at the uh, impact of family planning programs on fertility in South Africa, which might seem obvious that there would be an effect, but in fact, many places in the world we don't find uh, big effects of the programs. He did manage to document very uh, convincingly uh, uh, an impact of fa South Africa's program back uh, during the apartheid uh, era. Um, he also has a great paper looking at uh, uh, sun preference, sex preference in developing countries and how you can back it out of the observed outcomes about uh, sequences of uh, children born to, uh, to families. It's an extremely uh, interesting creative uh, piece of work. So Johannes, uh, did what he was supposed to do, wrote a great dissertation, got teaching awards along the way, got all kinds of other awards, and I know he's going to do a great job uh, as an assistant professor at Mount Holyoke. Congratulations. So the uh, next uh, graduate will be uh, Nietzsche, Pandalai Nayar, and uh, Andrei Levchenko will. Great, so uh, it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Nitya, Dr. Pandala Nayar. Uh, Nitya possesses three qualities as a researcher. Uh, the first is ambition, the second one is extremely hard work, and the third one is brilliance. 
Uh, and as we all know, pretty much academic success has a Leontief production function <laughs> in those three qualities. <laughs> so I've actually never been more confident about uh, the future success of a student that I've had. And uh, Nitya is already a colleague, and uh, I'm sure that she will be a colleague going forward. Uh, Nietzsche's job market paper is summarized by a question and an answer. The question is, did multinationals contribute to the loss of manufacturing jobs in the US? And the answer is yes. Uh, but So it's stated pretty simply, but the job market paper actually demonstrates amply these three qualities. So it's a big question that lots of smart people try to answer. And it's important for an ambitious person to go after this, these really big questions. Turns out that we didn't have the data to really answer the question properly. So the project involved a huge amount of backbreaking work in the basement of ISR to pull off. Uh, and finally, it involved some really nifty modeling and kinematics and so on, uh, which required brilliance. So. Uh, you know, it's just been wonderful to, to follow, uh, mostly as a spectator. Niti is off to Texas, Austin, with a stop at Princeton. And she also got uh, another fellowship, or postdoctoral -doc, post fellowship that is extremely fun to say, Baron Alexander Lafalusi Fellowship. <laughs> <laughs> so congratulations. <laughs> has been slaving away over the last five years, uh, working in the field of international macroeconomics. His job market paper had to do with the question which you probably think, why on earth, earth don't economists already know the answer to this question, which is, uh, are exchange rate devaluations expansionary? So when the exchange rate changes, don't firms export and sell more? It turns out that's a very hard question to answer because a lot of other things tend to happen when exchange rates move. And so Christian found this incredibly unique data set uh, from, of all places, the country of Estonia, but it had this unique uh, ability to identify firms that were selling to more than one market, uh, and so uh, you could you could actually see at the firm level uh, which exchange rate moved and what what specifically responded uh, to that exchange rate change, while being able to control for a lot of other things. So it was incredibly neat. Um, and um, we got to an answer that economists had been puzzling over for a very long time. And yes, exchange rate devaluations are expansionary. Uh, so we got an answer. Um, so he also has worked on, uh, he's a partner with Chris House and I on a project on uh, studying the impact of austerity policies, uh, which I think is a really important uh, policy issue right now. And he's also working in another whole area on mergers and acquisitions uh, in emerging markets. So I want to just conclude by saying, um, I don't know of a student who works harder, is more fearless in tackling a wide range of things. Uh, I just mentioned something and Christian goes and either gets the data or codes it up on the computer or solves it or runs the regressions. Um, so my, this is all by way of saying that my productivity is going to tank next year when he's <laughs> gone. Uh, so um, he is going off to the Ecole Polytechnique Federale de Lausanne in Switzerland. Uh, where I hope he will invite me so that I can have some more Swiss chocolate uh, and improve my French and we can work some more on projects. So. <laughs> yes, it's self-serve now. No. <laughs> uh, Daniel Reck and Joel Slumrod. My voice is not cooperating, so bear with me. Um, Daniel's dissertation research is about how to learn about people's preferences when some people are clueless and easily distracted from their true preferences and others uh, make wise choices. This is a ubiquitous problem on 
unfortunately, and is a difficult one. And the method that he's developed for answering this question, I think, will be quite influential and used for years to come. While Daniel's been here, he's also worked with me on several projects on the most fascinating topic of all economics, which is taxation. <laughs> it's been a great pleasure for me to work closely with Daniel over these past few years, and I think it's fair to say that I've learned at least as much from Daniel as he's learned from me. Uh, Daniel is off to the Berkeley for a year and then on to the London School of Economics. Next we have, is Rishi Sharma here? No. No, okay. Uh, uh, Ching Kung Wu? And Tillman. Great. <laughs> Congratulations. Um, uh, Ching Kung's uh, job market paper uh, starts with the uh, dramatic observation that you can't always say everything you would like to say. And so I reviewed it in preparing for this occasion. <laughs> uh, uh, and I should stop here, actually. That's, that was my plan. <laughs> uh, the, uh, so many economic systems uh, are designed to trick you into revealing your preferences. So, for example, an auction is designed to trick you into revealing your willingness to pay and then ideally pay as much of that as possible. But in some contexts, you are trying to reveal information and you can't say everything you want to say. So, for example, uh, some people, not me, but some people are soon going to vote between two presidential candidates. And maybe your vote cannot quite express how much you, um, um, which aspect of Hillary Clinton's uh, agenda you like and which you don't. And so many of these uh, preference revelation systems have coarse communication. You cannot uh, communicate everything you would like to say. The same is actually true in many auctions. And so the question that he studied is taking this constraint into account how to optimally design information revelation systems like auctions and like voting systems. Um, and I don't know whether that has affected the design of the ceremony, but in any case, uh, I think in the theory of mechanism design, that's an important and almost entirely unexplored area. And so I, um, what also I want to say is Ching Ong has been um, an incredibly, he's incredibly a gentleman, I don't know how to say this, incredibly good manners and <laughs> pleasant <laughs> behavior, just uh, the opposite of myself, <laughs> so no. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh, it has always been a pleasure to see him in uh, my office. And congratulations, he is <laughs> going to Hong Kong. The next person is, oh, Fudong, Fudong Zhang. And uh, hi, <laughs> and uh, Dimitri will speak. <laughs> Hi, it's a pleasure to introduce Fu Dong Zheng. Uh, he made uh, an exciting contribution on a, a highly relevant topic, the income inequality that is on everybody's mind. Fu Dong started by noticing that as income inequality goes up, the housing prices go up as well. And his research explains why it is not a coincidence. In a nutshell, the saving strategies available to well-to-do households include, among other things, accumulating multiple houses. And this, is, this seems to be what they do in China, pushing the prices up. So Fudong explained how the rise in income inequality can lead to a housing price run-up and how that can, in turn, feed back in to 
saving behaviors across the income spectrum. Uh, Fudong is uh, a great colleague and a caring and dedicated teacher. He is starting as an assistant professor at Tsinghua University, so now the brightest students in China will have a role model to lead and inspire them. Welcome, Dr. Zhang. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I feel so much smarter. I've learned so much economics in the last hour. Uh, so with that, that concludes the um, portion of our ceremony regarding the um, PhD students. Let's give them another round of applause. And to the advisors for their hard work. And now I'm going to turn the floor over to my colleague, John Leitner, and we are going to have the presentation of the Masters of Applied Economics degrees. Okay, thank you, uh, Linda. So the MAE program is the Masters of Applied Economics. Uh, the, uh, this is a two-year, or it's either three semesters or four at the student's uh, discretion. So we're looking at the students who entered in the fall of uh, 2014. So we had about 46 students enter, and. Um, Roughly a third of them graduated in, after three semesters in December, and we have uh, 27 now graduating today. When you're in a uh, master's program like this, uh, or in any graduate program at Michigan, you can also enroll in a second one if, if you find something related you want to work on. So we have 11 uh, dual degree students also, the current uh, most popular uh, Choices with the MAE would be from the School of Natural Resources and the math department. So the main uh, thing that we're going to do here today is to read the graduates' uh, names and to uh, recognize them for completing the program. Before we do that, though, uh, I want to stop for a minute to uh, recognize the, the officers in the class. So the, the MAE students in each class uh, elect a president and a vice president, uh, and uh, these officers serve for a year from December to December. And they play a big role in the program. The students are only here for a relatively brief time, and the officers organize uh, social events. Uh, they help uh, the administration with the communication of uh, career information and so on. Uh, and uh, in this case, they've, they've worked hard to offer mentorship to incoming students uh, as well. So I wanted to uh, see if I could call up to the podium the president, who is uh, Nabil Lopez, and also... <laughs> and the vice president as well. Uh, Yifu Wang. And if you guys will step up for a minute. The, uh, so the Department of Economics, in recognition of the helpful service that you've provided, has a couple of uh, medallions here. I was going to show it to you. I don't want to drop it and break it. Um, so I have one for Nabil and another for uh, Yifu. Thank you very much. So these guys have done a great job, and uh, as I said, the department is pleased to be able to recognize them. Uh, Nabil is off uh, in finishing to be an economist at, in the central bank uh, in the Dominican Republic. Yifu is off to take an analyst position at uh, Goldman Sachs in Singapore. We're, we're delighted to be able to recognize them. They've done an excellent job.
So I'm uh, going to go fast here. The, uh, uh, of course, we, all, we have a reception upstairs at 3 o'clock. Um, the second thing I wanted to do was to uh, congratulate the MAE graduating class. I've been uh, uh, in this uh, uh, job as the director of the MAE program. I've uh, also taught in the program in the macroeconomic theory course. I think I've had all the uh, students graduating here today in my class, and uh, I've spent time with each of them talking about their programs and what courses they should take. Uh, these are excellent students. Uh, they do a great job. Uh, many of them travel a long way to come here. English is not their first language, and yet they fit in and uh, uh, pick good courses and uh, make good use of the program. And uh, it's uh, been my pleasure to be associated with them and to work with them. And I congratulate them here on uh, finishing the program and, of course, wish them all the best in what they do next. So what we're going to do is read through the names and have the students come up. And we have uh, certificates. And uh, we want to congratulate them. And fortunately, I have my colleague, uh, Professor Heng Liu, to read the names, and I'm going to help Jim. If you've been here last year, you'd know. And I'm going to help Jim congratulate them. Chao Chen. Yeah. Samantha, Samantha Le Ling Chua. <laughs> Wei Fang. <laughs> Xiang Fang. Dan Yang Fu Shan He Yuan Liu Hu Ji Yong Li Yi Da Li Jun Hong Liang Xue Fen Lin Nabir Lopez Hawa Yue Ma Mayumi Matsushita Chiu Hong Piao Jin Ping Zi Jian Qi Charan Ravindra Superit Suwanik Yi Fu Wang David Yang Yuan Yuan Yang Xian Da Ye
同音。朱意玉，易思詹，然章。霞俊章，甄硕章，易请珠，泽奇珠。Okay, we're all set. Well, congratulations to all the MEE graduates. As I say, best wishes in the future. Okay, I think uh, Jim Adams then will finish with a couple of remarks. A couple is accurate. Uh, you've had now the food for thought. Uh, the department itself will be providing that other sort of food. Uh, we have liquids and solids uh, that are available in our library, which is one floor up. Uh, it's called the Foster Library. For those of you who would prefer an elevator, there is an elevator precisely in this direction, not too far away, but the grand staircase uh, will lead you to the same location. Thank you very much for participating today, and I look forward to meeting with some of you upstairs. <laughs>